Well, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm here. Okay. Welcome to Rock, Paper, Hand Grenades. I am Representative Gary Hopper from the big city of Ware, New Hampshire. Tonight, we have the Honorable Josh Moore. Who, why don't you know what town you're from? Hudson? Hudson? No. Merrimack. Merrimack. Same yeah. thing. So, <laughs> <laughs> you served how many terms? Two terms. Ter- two terms. He served two terms with us up at the uh, Funny Farm, or State House, as they call it. Yeah. And he's, he's into this new project, and he wanted to come on and talk about his new project. But before we get started, uh, my, uh, my um, uh, host, Sir Eric of Eastman, isn't here this evening. As many of the people who watch the show re- reasonably frequently know, he uh, was a producer or the director of a, uh, a short, a, a not short movie, actually, a regular movie called The Spin the Plate about a girl overcoming the the ramifications of abuse as a, a kid. And Spin the Plate keeps winning awards because he won an award down in Boston, which set him up to win another award. And then he was his one of the feature films at a the New York Film Festival, I think, two months ago. And now he came in, he talked to me today. He was actually here a few minutes ago. And he has to leave because he's, now he's part of a uh, film festival out in L.A., and that's where he's headed out now. And if anybody wants to see what it's, what it, his thing is all about, it's actually a really cool movie. But you can see the trailer for it on Vimeo. So if you go to Vimeo.com and type in Spin the Plate, you can see the uh, trailer for uh, for Eric's um, uh, movie. And it's pretty pretty cotton-picking awesome that he, you know, to see somebody like that, you know, uh, getting so much recognition for working so hard because – you know, um, and and as consumers, we see somebody come on TV and they become these famous actors or actresses, and we think, wow, they're like an overnight success. But typically, those overnight success took 20 years to get there. You just see that when it finally pops, you know. And hopefully, this is his big chance because uh, he's a pretty awesome guy. So that we wish, uh, pray for Eric and his, his adventure out in California, please. All right. <clears throat> Today. Today was crazy. So, you know, we had, uh, Josh, we know we know we had the, um, uh, okay, I should, I should back up. Tell them what we do with Organization Day. What's Organization Day? State House. Organization Day is just that, organizing. Hey, we get in, uh, the, all the new state reps are elected, or well, before they were, are sworn in, they're state rep elect, and uh, they get sworn in. You go through the formalities, and uh, you vote for the clerk. Uh, you vote for the secretary of state, which is an important position. And uh, I think, did I, catch, did I get all the details correct? No, there? not no. yet. No, you forgot so, the biggest part. I don't even, I don't even, I've only been through it twice, so. But yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. Uh, you get to get to go through all the formalities and actually get to meet a lot of people too, which is pretty cool. You get to meet people for the first time, you know, when everybody finally comes together on the biggest day. So it's a lot of fun. But um, yeah, like I said, I've only been through it twice though, you know. Okay. <clears throat> I'm gonna have you read this. Yeah. I don't know. Is that too small for you to read? Uh, cool? no, it's not too. You want me to read it right off? Okay. So I want so you take the oath of office too. Okay, the most important part of the day today was you take the oath of office. So I was going to have uh, you can probably read this first first half is good enough. So when you meet a state legislator, or state a state senator, or state house member, this is what they have to agree to and sign a paper that says they agree to it uh, before they can vote on speaker. Before they can vote on clerk, house clerk or house uh, sergeant at arms, before they can vote on anything, they have to agree to the following. I uh, insert name. Do solemnly swear that I will bear faith and true allegiance to the United States of America and the state of New Hampshire, and will support the Constitution thereof. So help me God. Exactly. It goes on from there, but Correct. that's that's a it's an important part. It is the the most important part. So yep. if you see your legislators, you know that the first thing they did, they did not vote, they did not agree to 
are swear to uphold the desires of their constituents, their party, or anything else, the only thing they swear to uphold is the Constitution. That's correct. That's a big deal. That is a huge deal. Uh, How many of them actually read the Constitution before they swore to uphold it? I don't know. Um, but it's 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 a huge deal. Yeah, no, it really is. So then we went from that. We elected um, the uh, Paul Smith as House Clerk. See, uh, people might not know is even though <clears throat> as we ru- the run up to the election, everything is so partisan. You know, yeah, them against us. When it comes to House and uh, and the uh, appointments by the House and Senate, it has always been bipartisan. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my first House clerk was Karen Wadsworth. She's a Republican, but she was elected by Democrats or Republicans because she did a really good job. Yeah. And now we have Paul Smith, who still does a very good job. And so we vote him. He's Republic was a Republican, but now he's, he's a House clerk. Um, we vote for the sergeant at arms. I'm not even sure what party he is. Um, but then... We get together in a joint session with the Senate, and we vote for uh, the Secretary of State. Mm -hmm. So your Secretary of State in Concord is voted on by the legislature. And this is the first time I've seen it become uh, partisan, ever. Because every every two years, how many times have you voted for Bill Gardner? Twice. Twice. Okay. Bill Gardner's a, a Democrat. Yep. Yeah, he is. Yeah. I mean, I voted. I, I remember my first election. I get in there and we said, who are we, who are we voting for uh, uh, Secretary of State? And they said, Bill Gardner. I said, yeah, but he's a Democrat. We get the Republican control. Why aren't we voting for a Republican? It's because he does a good job. Why would we vote somebody else? Hmm. Okay? Yep. That's all that mattered. Does he do a good job? Yes, he does a good job. Does he do it fairly? Yes. I mean, we talk about elections. That's basically one of the main things he's in, in charge of. Do you remember any stories in the news about hanging chads? Hanging chads? Nope. No. Nope. Do you remember uh, any uh, news articles about uh, one of the uh, you know one of the counties or something having you know extra boxes of ballots that nobody saw and they have to count at the last minute? Only in Florida. Only in Florida. <laughs> But in New Hampshire, you don't have that. Why? Because we have a really good Secretary of State. Right. Um, so it was it was bizarre to me to get to a point where uh, many Democrats wanted to get rid of him. Mm-hmm. So you had Democrats voting for uh, Bill Gardner, who's a Democrat, or Colin Van Ostern, who was a Democrat. Yep, that's correct. It's a tough choice, huh? <laughs> no. It was a no. simple choice. I know. I know. Yeah. It was a simple though, choice. And I didn't understand. You, you actually had the insight that I don't. I didn't have any clue why anybody would vote for Colin Van Ostrin. But you do. Go ahead. Tell me. Uh, well, <clears throat> oh, you're, so you're talking about uh, a conversation we had not too long ago, which was the fact that I thought he had it in the bag, the Colin yeah, Van Ostrin. <clears throat> well... Colin is an extreme leftist. Uh, he's in the pockets of these big, big billionaires, you know, across the U.S. Um, uh, they had over two hundred thousand dollars invested in this uh, bipartisan position, right? right? And uh, that I don't think that kind of money has been spent on that position Never. ever. Any, not even <clears throat> close. Right. So that's a lot of money. So uh, clearly, the Democrats and the extreme left really wanted this position, and a lot of it, as you said. Uh, that position has a lot to do with um, voting, right? Yep. Well, voter fraud has already been proven to happen in New Hampshire. Uh, that was exposed by Project Veritas uh, founder James O'Keefe. So you have a lot and, of this stuff. And it's also been exposed many times by uh, um, Ed Nail. Ed Nail, yep, yep. Yeah, um, Ed Nail's uh, local. He's been pursuing all this for many years, been doing a great job. Yeah. And uh, he's actually worked with Project Veritas on a number of these projects here in New Hampshire. So kind of back to Colin, um, I – Throughout this entire election of 2018, we saw a lot of really unfortunate people. <laughs> Let me just say it that way, right? Some real um, left-wing—I'll uh, even use the word Marxists. 
Uh, that's that that term is is exists for a reason. It's people who are on the extreme far left, and they get in there and they rile things up. I mean, you, you look at some of their tweets. You know, they're pretty vile. Like what? And, well, uh, what was it? Without um, cussing. Yeah, without cussing. Uh, well, there was one. I, bl- I believe the member is from Dover, if I'm not mistaken, and right. uh, the member said about a year and a half ago on Twitter that white men make me feel quote homicidal. Uh, oh yeah, so yeah, I remember there's that. plenty of the, and then that same member recently went on a cussing spree and was called out by CNN as the the most um, what do you, this person uses cuss words more than any other legislator in the nation on Twitter. Oh really? Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's essentially what they were saying. So the same and, rep. Same rep. So wow. can look, look no further than I believe Dover. Okay. Or maybe, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I know uh, who you mean. She's, yeah. She's the one who uh, I, I I want her to answer this if she's listening. Is you know last term she kept calling it the the uh, New Hampshire's rape culture at the state house. Yeah, yeah, and then and I'm, she I'm, had, so I want to know now the Democrats are in charge. Is it still the rape culture, or is, I think we'll see that flip and it'll be all of a sudden overnight it becomes. The most glorious unicorn type land ever. Unicorn. You know, it's it's the it's the, <laughs> the 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 utopia we have been waiting for. Um, no, so to kind of bring it and not to not to talk about a specific member to come back to the reason why I thought they had it in the bag. You've got these types of people who have who follow Van uh, Austin, and they they wanted him in. So these are these are. Well, you know how they call it on the right, extremists. Well, these are extremists on the left. These are people who really have bad, bad views, naughty views, vile views, you know, and they push them as an agenda, and it's it's unfortunate. So, going back to Austin, that's what I, I thought he had in the bag. I thought for sure, of course, he's got it, you know, because they have the majority by far, right, the Democrats, yep. this, this go around. And um, if they can, if the Republicans can – seem to pick off a few Democrats, I don't think it's going to be enough to to make the win. Because you're talking about, what, 167 right now in the majority? Yeah, but we flipped, the, we flipped like this once in a while. This happens. Oh, right, right. I'm just talking about the numbers specifically. We're at 167. Is that correct? Something like that, yeah. So roundabout. So you had to do 30 plus. It was like 35 votes you needed to to snag off the Democrats yeah. to make this happen. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know if it's exactly 35, but it's somewhere in the 30s. Uh, and you got it. You got it, you know. Right. So I, I was shocked. I was wrong. I was happy to admit that I was totally wrong, and I, I was. I was shocked. Sure. The thing is, it, it. I understand that the, the lady you're talking about, she's off a. She's she's lost. She is so full of rage that she doesn't think clearly. Um, and that's wh- whatever. It, I don't care. You're saying that she's a fringe. She, she has to be a fringe. Well, I mean, because like you said, that yeah. I, I know that um, you look at um, Antifa, which is one of the big active groups in this country right now. Right. They yep. run around with hammer and sickle flags, with communist flags. That's right. They do. And I've said this on the show, but a hammer and sickle, if you see a hammer and sickle flag, if you're not as offended by that as you are a Nazi flag, you're ignorant of history. Yep. The, right. the Nazis killed, I think, six million of their own people. The communists have killed, I think, like almost 100 million of their own people. Yeah. What Hitler did that everybody's offended by, the communists quadrupled, or if not, you know, a lot more than that. No, it's true. So and- communism... Be- the reason is, and you know this, Josh, is that communism relies on the premise that the state becomes God. Well, that's true. It's the provider. It becomes the parent. It becomes, it becomes the parent. The the ruler. The you know what the three things this is this is uh, um, the three things Mao Zedong, Joseph Stalin, and Adolf Hitler and have in common. Hmm. They were all atheists. Darwinists and socialists. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you take Darwinism, which says that uh, the whole Darwin Darwin principle is that you are the product of evolution. If we are the product of evolution, that means by definition that some of us did not evolve to a high, as high a level as another one. Well, you're getting deep now. (laughs) Well, that's what it works out. It's true, though. Yeah, no, it's true. 
So therefore, if some of us have evolved to a lower level than the others, mm -hmm. then they are a drain on the, the uh, human condition, and it is only reasonable to exterminate them just like a – if you had a horse that was born that was defective, you would want to kill it before you ended up with a bunch of horses that were defective. If you're only looking at, from a Darwin perspective, eliminating sectors of society that are a drain to society only makes sense. It is absolutely positively logical. Yeah, that's Now, true. if you look at it like we do, that there is a God, he created everybody, and each was created for a reason— then you have no authority to take anybody's life for any reason, except you know, you know, like somebody's a murderer or something like that. Right. When they've basically decided to go over the top. But anyway, sure. So there's two ways of looking at it, and all those people looked at it like a Darwinist perspective that killing off people that are useless is beneficial for the whole. Right. And so relating that back to. Uh, kind of, kind of what we were talking about, Van Ostern and having these the ex extreme radicals on the left, if you will. Uh, I, I don't think that you, you know you were talking about you know these this Antifa group out here going out with the sickles and they're they're riding, they're flipping cars, or they're bringing violence to America. You know, different well, they're anti free speech. Well, they are. Um, do we see that in some of our members in the New Hampshire House? No, we haven't seen anybody flipping cars. No, no, not but we cars. have seen but extreme verbal verbal attacks, most certainly. So while we haven't necessarily seen those same physical actions, that same rage is still inside their heart, and it's very clear. They're just being more uh, tactful about it. You know, I saw that rage in the hallway today. Right. And so that's no, my... No, I'm, I'm saying, I'm, I'm serious. I saw that in the hallway today. You saw... <coughs> that same for... rage that you're talking about. It was not to the point of violence, but it was pretty close. What were they doing? Um, so this today, because it's Organization Day, many legislators like myself have family members, and they go up into the, the uh, balcony and, and they announce that, you know, so-and-so is here for... And, and they're all introduced, and that's how we kind of the formality right well there was a line going up to get into the balcony and it stretched all the way around the the third floor down into the second floor and so we're all in line i was I'm, excuse me i was with my wife and grandson just talking to him because i had time before i had to get in and uh this woman had a sign and she uh, has some physical disability or something. And she's yelling at people. So oh, why are you guys in the way? Get out of the way. She's trying to cut, cut in front of people and yelling at them while she's cutting in line. Right? And she says, I'm a union member. Blah, 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 right? My wife is a teacher. She turns to the woman and, and quite directly, not, you know, didn't get angry, but directly looked at her and says, ma'am, I'm a union member and you're making us look bad. Oh, oh! Called her out, huh? Called her out. Woo! She was trying to cut line. Well, what it, what it was is she didn't realize that was the line. Okay. So she thought people were just blocking the the stairway. Ah. Uh, so okay. she didn't check to find out what was going on and sure. be polite and try to as assess the situation. She just assumed and became enraged. Yeah. And was acting like a complete jerk. Yeah, that's and that's what <laughs> it is. It, it's it's, it's rage. true. Is it, like it. Well, people are people are on high alert now. People are angry. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of hate in the hearts of man right now. There is. It's really tragic and uh, it's it's horrible to see. But to kind of put closure on on the Van Ostern thing, that that's why I think he had it in the bag. So that's uh, we we've got. Well, and it's already been coined. I mean, Charlie Kirk of the Turning Point uh, USA has already talked about it, cultural Marxism. You know, yep. so it goes from being policy now to just being physical force on the streets as well, shutting down free speech. You know, um, it's unfortunate. It's actually it's worse than unfortunate. This is this is bad. It's a, it's this it's is a, it, really bad. It poses an actual an actual real and present danger to the Constitution because if it really you, does if you like on on college campuses. Um, if you say certain things, you're, you 
it's called hate speech. So using the term hate speech for somebody who says something that you disagree with. Correct. And most people, it's tough. Uh, well, number one, speech is covered under the Constitution, including hate speech. You know, yes, I, I mean, if, if you, you can, but if you can no longer find a right. place to to rationally do it, right? No, I I hear you. I agree. Like on Facebook, if they shut you down because you say that you believe that Jesus Christ created, uh, you know, Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Well, that's your opinion, and if 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 uh, Facebook decides that's hate speech. All of a sudden, you can't even have your opinion anymore. Right. So if you have freedom of speech but no place to speak, yeah, it's you know, true. you've lost your freedom. Of, and it's it's happening on college campuses, which used to be classic liberalism. Yes, it was did. the idea that you should be able to express yourself. If you go to college, that is a place to learn, to express yourself, to explore different ideas, and to find out if they have value or not value. Yeah. But you can't do that if if um, if all those discussions are shut down because people are offended. If everybody's offended by everything, that's correct. And that's actually one thing uh, that we're looking to do with the Patriot Initiative is change that culture. Okay, let me finish up on the Van Alstrom so, thing, and then, then yeah, we'll sure. go right to that because that's a good segue. It is. Uh, so I anyway, <laughs> we had we had um, uh, I forget the, n the number now. It was. The first vote for Secretary of State, keep in mind that Van Osteren had a quarter of a million dollars. Yeah, that's a lot of money. Boy, and that's a ton of money. That's a ton of money. And I think Bill Gardner typically had a few thousand dollars that he would send mailers out, and that was it. Um, I don't know how much he had, but it wasn't much. Um, so he had a quarter of a million dollars. He said that he was going to use his money to help people get elected. Then he realized it was kind of a conflict. So he says, no, no, I'm not going to do that. And then all of a sudden, magically, there was this um, um, pack that was resurrected. A bunch of money was thrown into it. And then people started running for house seats, started getting money from this pack. And that pack helped a bunch of people get elected. And so those are the the core group of people that were voting for Van Ostrin. There was a, they, yeah. in other words, Van Ostrin was very legitimately trying to buy the Secretary of State's office. Sure. His mailers, on his mailers, it, it, what, what the heck did it say? I, just give me two seconds. One, two. Not, <laughs> two more. I had to be, had to keep, be funny. Keep going like that. with the twos. Yeah, one, two, huh? You know, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, $250,000 is a ton of money uh, for, for a position like that. I mean, when you consider it, when you're comparing it to the state rep races, you're talking about, a, you know, a grand at most from most districts. Okay, unless you so live in Manchester or Merrimack or Hudson or whatnot. This is how deceptive, like I said before, he's deceptive about the fact that he was actually trying to buy house seats, you know, help people get elected so that yeah. they would vote for him for Secretary of State. Josh, this is the mailers we're getting as legislators, and it, it, this is on a bunch of them. I called the Secretary of State's office because it seems like it's illegal, or at least it's false advertising. It says, free and fair, New Hampshire. That's the pack, I guess. Colin Van Ostren, Secretary of State. Read that yourself. Did yeah, that I know. say Colin Van Ostren for Secretary of State? No, it doesn't no, say it for. No, it implies that he is the Secretary of State. Right. And he did that on all his mail. I don't know about all, all the ones I saw. So I, I guess my, and if I'm going to be totally fair about it, you know, um, and I, I understand, I see your concern there. When state, when a candidate run for state rep or state senate, they don't always put four. They'll say, you know, s your name, uh, state rep, you know, just to save room. You know what I mean? So would, would that be so similar? No, because these are these were like documents and stuff like that. It okay. wasn't like a uh, always a regular ad. Um, so no, I don't think it's the same thing. Interesting. I don't know. I mean, it, it gives the it gives the impression that he already is a Secretary of State. So anyway, so it came down to the vote today. Um, Lou D'Alessandro, you you guys, uh, a lot of people listening are in in Lou D'Alessandro's district. He did a great job today. I don't like praising him because he I disagree with him on almost everything else. But to, to be fair, he did a great job today nominating 
uh, Bill Gardner, Secretary of State. Um, the first vote, you needed 209 to win. The first vote came out. These are all, uh, uh, in, if for Secretary of State, it's a secret ballot. You take a piece of paper, you check off Bill Gardner's name or Van Ostrand's name, and then you give it to the, uh, put it in the uh, ballot box at the State House. And so the first one went around, and uh, Bill had 208, and Van Austin had 207. Whew. Man, that's a close vote. That's super close. And then there's some one other vote. political wrangling and, and things like that. And we had a second vote, and it was uh, 208 to 205. Jeez. The number of legislators had dwindled a little bit. So to get half plus one, he only needed 207, I think. So, the, so on the second ballot, Bill won, mm. but we came very close to su outside money. 100,000 of it, I think, came from out of state. We came very close to outside money and big money buying the Secretary of State's seat, and I've never seen anything like that for these seats. Oof. Yeah, that's rough. That's a, Like I said, <coughs> a lot of money. But you did the right thing. You, it, you, you, it came you kept out, Gardner, you yeah. know? So anyway, your project. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, where do I start? I, so I founded an organization called the Patriot Initiative, uh, and our our vision and mission is to restore culture and government. Okay. And so I just want to go back a little bit here and kind of explain how I came up with this vision, why, why it's in my heart, right? Um, and this kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier. So um, I've served as a legislator uh, for four years, yep. and now officially former state rep. Woo! What Still a crazy. Still honorable. You're honorable. <clears throat> honorable. Honorable. But I am a former state representative now, so there's that, definitely. And um, I sat on the education committee for four years. Uh, so I know all too well what's going through the college education system, uh, through the high schools and public education, the whole bit. And it's it's pretty tragic. It's rough. Um, not to mention I graduated high school not too relatively long ago, 10 years ago. <laughs> right now it's starting to get ahead of me. Um, so about a couple years ago, um, I it kind of struck me. I thought... You know what? I'm I'm really when I'm in committee and I'm you've got these people coming in talking about different issues specifically as it relates to education, but not exclusive to it, right? Because yeah. you know we were as a legislature deal with all issues, and I thought, you know, I want to debate it this way. I want to have a conversation this way because this is just crazy. But we're, we're debating policy and everything, but we we don't even have our fundamentals right. You right. know, our our value system isn't even right. We've got communism and Marxism rapidly sweeping our public school system and universities in our nation, right? And I thought, we can't even have a conversation about policy when we don't even agree on the fundamentals in the first place. So how do we even... Th this conversation is is futile. It, it's pointless without having an understanding. Like like the Constitution. How do you run for public office if you've never even read the Constitution? You're, you're, you're taking an oath to uphold the very document you, you're... That you haven't even read yet? I mean, that just doesn't make sense, right? Holding a document you're ignorant of. Correct. And so that's kind of how I looked at it with these issues. We're talking about issues that we're ignorant of their foundation anyway in the first place. Yep. So as I was thinking about it, I said, we really need to get our principles correct. We really need to come back to the values that made this country great. We need to come back to the Constitution and understanding that and understanding the Declaration of Independence, the founding documents of this country, what our, what our founders believed in, and relate those principles Right. And those precepts to today's current issues and what we're facing now, whether it be uh, and I'm just going to name off some issues here, climate change, uh, sexuality as it relates to the structure of the family, LGBT um, and sex outside of marriage, Second Amendment, free speech, sexism, racism, you name it. We're going to we want to we need to go after all those issues. Right. And so as I'm sitting here, I thought something needs to be done about this. Um, so. Over the course of a couple of years, um, and it really started beginning my second term, I, I decided uh, um, that I wanted to do something about this. Yeah. Uh, and I actually went and worked for the Leadership Institute. Uh, th there was something that initially – Who was that? That's uh, Morton Blackwell. It's, it's a, he's a c conservative um, guy. He uh, – mm -hmm. Founded the pa excuse me the patronage. So I was going to drop mine. See, that, that's becoming part of me. Um, he founded the Leadership Institute. They're in Arlington, Virginia, or okay. just really in the D.C. area, and uh, they focus on uh, getting conservatives to come in. They're they're nonpartisan, but they are 
really well known as a conservative group and you come in and they do they offer trainings around the nation uh, yeah. on the logistics of campaigning you could be get out the vote fundraising district door knocking stuff like that you know um so anyway i worked for them for uh, about eight months and then we parted ways and uh, i found out i thought you know what this is not what i want to do we we need to raise up men and women particularly young men and women right yeah who understand the values that this nation was built on the principles that this this nation was built on we need to come back to our founding values that's what we need to begin to realize and understand and not just understand them we need to raise men and women up who can run for public office or get involved in public leadership as it relates to politics and government. Sele it, yeah, but and, so all kinds of different things, selectmen, school oh, board. That's my point. Yeah. Everything. I'm not just talking about state rep or state senator. I'm talking about every elected position. That's what we need to start going for. All of them. That's what the left is doing. That's what. So we need to play their game, just not exactly the way they do it. And I'm going to explain how that's done. So, um, I founded the Patriot Initiative back in June, and uh, now we're really starting to catch traction here. We got a we got a number of uh, sh young people who ran for public office recently who are on our on, on our team now. Okay. Uh, it's it's building up nice and strong. Uh, so. I've already talked with some national names about it. I'm actually going to D.C. to talk about this okay. uh, next week. And a uh, lot of things stirring up. So I'm gonna, I want to just lay out for a couple minutes here what our plan is and how we plan to accomplish this. Because that vision, right, I think most people can get around that vision. They could say, that's really great, getting young people involved. Well, the, thi I, the thing is, you, if you go back to the founding documents, <clears throat> the whole premise was like, for instance, we are endowed by our creator with certain unleanable rights. Yep. Just that statement is is so amazing. Yep. It's because people get caught up and look at s some of the things that were going on 200 years ago or 500 years ago, and they realize how cruel life was and how horrible people yeah. were, right? It's true, yep. But the Constitution and the documents were about perfect ideals, God-given ideas. That Just that statement, we are endowed, we are given, we, we are born with certain rights that the state or anybody else cannot take away. They yeah. do not have a right to take it away. That's correct. That statement is so foreign to life 200 years ago. <laughs> you got it. it. You had, uh, um, I think uh, if you go back and, and look at any history, you go back to say the Middle Ages when there was like a lord of a uh, uh, an area, okay? And, and I'm sure you've heard of people being whipped or beaten and stuff like that. You know why? Because that person did not have any self-determination. Mm -hmm. That person was owned by almost enslaved by yep. that lord so so it was no different than somebody beating their dog yep that's correct so when you go from you know 400 years ago where humans are just you know different humans are owned by different people cuz we look at slavery and say oh so how bad it was it was bad but it was not unusual yeah you That's know, correct. they they say uh, there was oh this is this is so sad. So one of my kids is in school, and the teacher says, "Sometimes I feel guilty for being white, knowing that white people own slaves." Yeah, that is a that's a teacher who's teaching history at a school in Manchester. Mm -hmm. It's she has to be so so profoundly ignorant of history yep. because. Okay, you won't. You're guilty because you're white because you own slaves. You do realize that at some point your people were probably slaves, and there's black people that have been slaves. There's Jewish people that have been slaves. There's Irish people who have been slaves. There's English people who I'm sure who have been slaved. There's been people that's been selling each other. The in Spain, they used to take these white young blonde girls in Spain, and capture them once every now and again a bunch of them and send them back off to the uh um the persian king the muslim persian king yeah. they were all sex slaves yeah uh right now 
If you go to Libya, the one that yep. Obama desta- destabilized, along with Hillary Clinton, guess now that it's sta- destabilized. Guess what they're doing? What's that? They're selling people. They're selling people into slavery in Libya right now. Hmm. Okay? So saying the ignorance of saying, well, I feel guilty because I'm white because maybe 150 years ago somebody I knew owned a slave is ignorant to the fact that those are not the only people who were slaves. It's ignorant to the fact that it's just as likely that her ancestor was one of the people whose dads or brothers was fighting against slavery for the North. Right. There's like hundreds of thousands of guys that died defending those people and freeing the slaves. And somehow we're supposed to forget that. Right. And feel guilty. I I agree. And this goes back to talking about unalienable rights. Uh, Exactly. Something that's actually, there's a couple of things that are missed, uh, and I want to go over them real quick because they relate to the Patriot Initiative, and, and it is, they relate to issues that we're actually going to help people understand, and I want to go into a little bit of what our mission is going to be because I think you'll really resonate with it. I think the people really appreciate this. Uh, we've taken a lot of time to think about this and really go over it. So um, going over the Declaration of Independence, number one, uh, the word creator is actually a title, a name in there. It's with a capital C if you right. look at the original text. Uh, why is it with a capital C? Again, name. It's a title. Right, and a title. Exactly. It's it's how the founders viewed God. That is God they're talking about. And so there's a lot of God in, in the Declaration of Independence. I, I believe it's mentioned. he's mentioned several times in different ways, right, different titles. So as you're looking through that, the other thing that's uh, really interesting about it uh, is the fact, and not necessarily the Declaration of Independence, but going to go on what you were talking about, oath. According to Noah Webster's 1828 Dictionary, oath is defined as a promise to God, right? Right. Is a, is a promise to God. So when you think about the original definition of oath, you're, you, what you're really saying when you take the oath of office, uh, like the, what happened today, all those state representatives today made a promise before God and to God that they will uphold the, the Constitution, both state and federal. Right. That's a huge undertaking. That is a massive responsibility. And I can tell you that as a former state rep, having served two terms, I took that very seriously because not only in my background, about I believe in God and trust in God, but I knew going into that position that that was a responsibility I had been given by my constituents Right? Yep. It was a responsibility I had to be given. They entrusted this to me, and I was taking that oath seriously, saying, I'm held accountable to a much higher power than just people. I'm held accountable to um, God himself, right? And so when I die, I'm going to go to the pearly gates, and this is going to become uh, one of those things as mentioned. What did you do with the responsibility I gave you as a state rep through the, your, the people that chose to rep, you, have you represent them, right? Yep. That's a big undertaking. So those are two things right there that are massive, and we need to begin explaining to people. Now, is it going to happen overnight? Are we going to be just knock on a couple noggins and say, hey, in there, you got, you got the oath down part? You know, do you understand what an oath is now? Yeah, but I don't believe in God. Okay, well, you're going to run into that problem. That's okay. We want to have these conversations. I want people of all different walks of life to come into these forums, which I'll explain here in a second, so they can can have the conversation and learn what's going on. It's really important. And just very quickly. No, it's okay. I just... When we're looking at the forums, that's what that's the first thing we're going to do. So we go through three points on our in a, the Patriot Initiative is education, communication, and activation. The first part is education through these forums. We're going to be discussing cultural topics, and it's not it's going to be myself, of course, as the visionary for the uh, the organization and the founder. Uh, but we have a lot of really big names that we're going to bring in people who are respected and have knowledge in uh, in their respective areas, right? That they have expertise on, and we're going to discuss an array of issues, but we want people to come in, young and old, right, to come in and have these conversations and say, here's where we're missing it, right? And we're going to have these forums so people can discuss back and forth. We're going to have them all over the state of New Hampshire, and we hope, we expect, as resources allow us, to expand outward in other states as well. So we're very excited about that. And when it goes to the communication part of it, that's very, very important. We want to be able to follow up pe- with people. We want to be able to communicate effectively with people and teach people how to communicate effectively. So that's 
that's going to be another aspect to this whole thing. That's in conjunction with both the forums as we communicate between one another back and forth, right? And then the third part is educate. I mean, uh, excuse me, not education, activation. And where the activation comes in, we're going to have trainings and events where we can bring aspiring constitutional conservatives. Once they've, once they've come out of these forums and they say, you know what, I've attended these forums for six months, right? Just kind of give an example. I've attended these forums for six months. I've been to multiple different forums and I really like what you're talking about, Patriot Initiative. I, I love what I've learned and I want to hold true to these values too. I believe in these in my heart now. You know, now I'm inspired to get involved, whether it be running for a public office in some local or state level or whether it be just getting involved as maybe somebody you consider yourself an activist, somebody who's in Involved in the public community, fighting for a uh, to get somebody in office who believes the same way and believes in the founding principles. That's the goal, and we want to raise up leadership in those areas to begin to take these things back. So again, that's where we're storing culture, and out of the restoration of culture, we inspire p leaders to rise up, and then we train them how to articulate their point of view, how to surround themselves with wise counsel, and so on. There's the the tools that we're going to equip people with are going to be found really nowhere. Um, there's certain organizations that may teach a bit here or there, but we're putting it in one big package. And you're not going to find this with the Leadership Institute. You're not going to find this with the New Hampshire GOP. You will not find it with the Young Americans for Liberty, Young Americans for Freedom, Turning Point USA. And that, by the way, that is not a knock to those groups I just named off. Yeah. Those are great organizations. They're national organizations. They're wonderful. I have the highest amount of respect for each of them. They all play their part. But they're not filling the gap where I need to see it filled. You, you understand what I'm saying? So well, there's I, a vision I, here for this. I know that um, I, I know that you're you're right. Mm -hmm. I know that the reason New Hampshire Republicans lost in the House mm -hmm. <clears throat> is because too many people don't even understand the process. I'll give you an example. You didn't run this year, so you might not have seen it. I got a mailing attack ads against um, myself to saying that if I was elected, that I was going to mess around with people's Social Security. Okay? Well, you know, as a state rep, we have absolutely no nothing to do with Social Security. Not at all. It doesn't matter how I vote or if I vote. There's no vote or law that I can introduce that I know of, <laughs> yeah. we, ne we never vote on Social Security. No, it's not, we don't. It's not a variable. Yeah, it's not a, it's not a state issue, <clears throat> unfortunately. But they're relying, they're, first of all, they know they're lying, right? They have to know, they have, if they're politically active enough to send out mailers, they have to understand what the truth is. Sure. So they know they're lying and they're preying on people's ignorance. Yes, that's correct. And what we need is a group like that to start filling in that gap so people understand what the truth is, what civics is, what the founding documents were. Have, have you ever seen the original Article 6 of the New Hampshire State Constitution? The original? The original. I'm going to go ahead and say safely no. I can't, I can't say it verbatim. But basically the original... Article 6 of the New Hampshire tar Constitution. Morality and piety? Mor morality okay, and piety. Mind, yes. Yep. They don't know what that means. Piety is reverence for, for God. God and family. That's right. Okay. Yep, that's exactly right. So the, the title for that constitutional amendment is uh, the necess necessity for morality, reverence for family, and God. Yep. That's exactly right. That's the title. That's just the first words. Yes. Then it I have read it. Well, no, you haven't read the original. The original goes on to say that to make sure that we can hold on to this republic, we need to teach kids yes. evangelical principles. principles. No, I actually did read the original. Oh, now, you you're jogging yeah. my memory now, yes. Actually, in fact, so much to the point, I had talked to Representative Dan Itza about reinstating that or bringing that the, that language back into the Constitution in my second term. Yeah. Um, I don't remember what came up in prohibiting me from it. I wanted to make sure I had all my eggs lined up, and it didn't. But that is something I wanted to see come back. Because, actually, it's interesting you bring that up, uh, Representative Hopper. Uh, because Mr. Gary to you. <laughs> Mr. Gary, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, so the original state constitutions, the original 13 colonies, um, many of them 
especially prior to the uh, mid 1800s, really the Civil War era, right? All required in their state constitutions that you profess your belief in God or and or Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. Yeah. In order as a prerequisite to hold office. Yeah, you could not. <clears throat> they had state churches. Yes. And people don't believe that today. I have actually a former member of the House who got, was unseated in the primary um, over in, in uh, Rochester. I was talking, you may know who I'm talking about. He was an atheist, a uh, big, you know, satanic symbols yes, all over I his. Yes, I do know what you mean. And we were chatting uh, one time, and he said, well, that's just not true. You know, that, that's, that's a state church. You know, there's separation of church and state. No, there was not. Uh it was the original state constitutions allowed until they were amended. They allowed for a state church to be established. That was okay to the founding fathers. What was not okay was having a federally established church. Yes. That's what the pilgrims ran from. But they could have a state established church if the constitution allowed it. Right. And that's what it boiled well, down to. They could to. have a state a constitution, constitutional church. Like, for instance, in New Hampshire, you had to be a Protestant yes. to serve in the New Hampshire letter. That is, that is correct, and that is my point. You, but you, that was, that was let, the wall of ch separation of church and state yep. was the Danbury Baptist church. church of Connecticut. That's Thomas Jefferson's sent letter. Sent a letter to Thomas Jefferson because they lived in a congregational state Yep, and asked Thomas Jefferson, said, can they— can the congregational state of Connecticut force us Baptists to believe what they believe? And that's when Thomas Jefferson said, no, there is a wall of separation between church and state. That's correct. The state can't force you to believe what you, they want you to. That's correct. Okay, you, so you the it. wall of separation was never about keeping people, keeping religious understanding in the government. Or keeping God out of government, it was a, it was basically a statement that that a, if you want to believe the Christian faith, you want to believe there's nobody that can stop you from doing it. And 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 b, that this is a, is a moral, it's it, the morals and the laws in this country are based on Christian values, period. That is exactly right. There will never be a federal. Yep. religion or, right. or denomination. I think if somebody had said denomination, it would have made more sense in today's language. And that's actually what they meant back then. Was that's When they said religion, they meant denomination. They didn't specify... In fact, what a lot of people think is even when you read back, looking at... They're, they're saying religion... Uh, that people thought, oh, yeah, that's Christianity as opposed to Islam or whatever. No, no. it was actually congregational church. It was not just congregational because that was the actually Baptist denomination. I'm talking about the, the denominations, the different religious sects of the church. You know what brings right? that, what, It's really interesting. What brings that point home, I think, pretty well is in Massachusetts, um, you had to have accepted Christ as Lord and Savior to be governor. Yeah. Okay. Um so anyway, in the early 1800s, John Adams went into the state constitutional convention and received a standing ovation because he was so, you know, one of the, the, the uh, big enchiladas forming the Constitution. Enchiladas are really good, by the way. <coughs> <laughs> and uh, he got a standing ovation. Yep. He put in a, an amendment to the state constitution, or tried to, to allow freedom of religion to extend to Judaism. Mm. His argument was that the Jewish people were good moral people and would be an asset to the state to have them included. Yeah. He lost. Hmm. Okay, so people who want to say this, that the state has no say, they absolutely had all kinds of say. Yes, they did. Freedom of religion <clears throat> was not extended to the Jews in Massachusetts because it wasn't, they weren't Christians. That's correct. And so you have a lot and, of that history. I, I, by the way, I agree with Adams. I think the, the mor moral piety that the Jewish people exhibited was the type of uh, faith and, and root, root faith that this country needed for it to, to, to flourish. So the, the Jewish um, mindset or religion and faith is absolutely consistent with the founding documents. That's precisely it. That's exactly right. And you nailed it. And, and sadly, when it comes to the separation of church and state, um, 
theory, if you will, I'm going to call it that, because that's really what it boils down to is an interpretation. It's not factual based on whatsoever. It actually came down in 1947 in a, in a case called Everson versus Board of Education. And uh, I believe it was a young lady who wanted to take an elective course, or there was an elective course you could take in school, and she challenged it in the whole bit, and then it became a big court battle. Right, and right. Then, So for 150 years or something of the sort, uh, since that the time, since Jefferson's letter, right, uh, the, the Supreme Court had to use the entire letter within context to show the context of his, his wall between church and state quote. They'd show, they offer the entire letter and read it and, and reference that whole letter in their decision. The first time it was ever only taken out of context, just that simple statement alone, wall between church and state, was in 1947. Well, of course, once you take that sentence out and you get rid of the rest of the letter that puts it in context, well, now you've got, now you have what we call today a sound bite, right. you know? And they use that to ma base their decision on that one simple statement, and that's where it went wrong. So now everybody, since 1947, every, a lot of uh, many Americans, uh, too many, right, believe that this idea of separation in church and state has just been a part of our founding fathers and a part of the founding era since the very beginning, and it wasn't. It never, and it, it was never supposed to be a part of it at yeah. all. So we could go into a lot of that stuff, but... The point is, you know, going back to talking about what we're trying to do and create a culture shift, we're not only trying to create a culture shift. We want to inspire and train young men and women and those who are older as well when they come out of these uh, forums, right, and begin raising them up to run for public office and get involved in public yeah, so leadership. so that they, under, they that, actually <coughs> understand the, the, the basics of yes, the Constitution. absolutely. The basics of this country. And once you see the basics and it becomes clear to you, Everything else makes sense. Yes, that's exactly right. Because one of the, I'll, I'll give you a quick example here of one reason why it, it was, minutes, I've, been, so. I've been I've been really frustrated is because my the the four ter the four years I served I saw what we call squishy Republicans or moderate Republicans get in and vote one way and they told their constituents something totally different and I don't like that and I don't like seeing the dumbing down of our nation and our populace and the young people losing the values and the principles that this nation was founded on so what we want to get we want to get people in who believe and espouse the founding values and principles of this country and we will do it and our first you know what our first test is 2020 Josh we have to go that's okay I wish you luck thank you very much let me know if you want me to you know, come in and talk to anybody or anything else. If I can help you, yeah. Is it okay if I drop my uh, the uh, website? Yeah, go. Cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's uh, the Patriot Initiative USA dot org. That's the Patriot Initiative USA dot org, and we are also on Facebook under the Patriot Initiative. Okay. So that's where we're at. Yep. And uh, yeah, because it's it's if you if you know people are looking for answers. Sure. If you look over the last fifty years, the further away we get from God. The more we see kids on dope, well, because life has no meaning. If there is no God, there is no reason. If there is no reason, why not shoot up? Yeah. If there is no God, there is no reason. Why not go shoot a bunch of people at school? At least I can become famous before I die. Exactly. If there is no God, there is no purpose. That's right. You guys, we'll see you next week.